Bangladesh's government launches a ruthless crackdown on a deadly drug called Yaba. But exactly who are they targeting? I'm Imran Garta and today's newsmaker is Bangladesh's drug war. There are fears that the government's drug war in Bangladesh could turn into a bloodbath. More than 120 alleged drug dealers have been killed in less than a month. And Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina says she's just getting started. Many are accusing the government of using the campaign as an excuse to carry out extrajudicial killings. Some even compare it to Rodrigo Duterte's deadly drug war in the Philippines. It all began with a product called Yaba a cheap pill that smuggled across the Myanmar border, allegedly by Rohingya refugees. And the drug has taken its toll on the country's estimated 7 million addicts. So, is the government's anti-narcotics campaign sincere, or are they using it as a cover to take out their political opponents? Heider Abbasi has this report. They're being found every day, lying on the streets of Bangladesh bodies peppered with bullets. In just over two weeks, at least 122 people have been killed, most of them in police raids. Thousands more have been arrested. This is Bangladesh's war on drugs. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina launched an anti-drug campaign last month, and she's taking a zero-tolerance approach. No drug peddler will be spared by any chance. They must quit this illegal business. We will conduct more of these raids and the Rapid Action Battalion will take every necessary step against narcotics. And this is the drug of choice. It's called Yaba, a mix of caffeine and methamphetamine. Bangladesh says it has around 7 million drug addicts and says 5 million of those are hooked on Yaba pills. The drug isn't made in Bangladesh, the government believes it's being smuggled in from Myanmar and accuses some of the Rohingya refugees that fled Myanmar of selling Yaba in Bangladesh. The police operation has been compared to the drug war in the Philippines, where President Rodrigo Duterte has encouraged a shoot-to-kill policy. Bangladesh denies all allegations of extrajudicial killings. It says police officers are only defending themselves when they open fire on suspected drug traffickers. But human rights activists aren't convinced. In a gunfight, we fear that the injuries or casualties will be on both sides. But we are not seeing that there's any casualty on the other side. We can kind of uh, conclude that these are extrajudicial killings. And the families of some of those killed say they were taken into police custody just hours before being found dead. The government is also accused of using the operation as a cover to remove political opponents. The opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party says some of its members have been killed in the campaign. But Bangladesh has been here before. It faced the same allegations of unlawful killings during its operation to crush militants last year. Since Sheikh Hasima came to power in 2009, one human rights group has recorded 429 cases of enforced disappearances and 1,528 extrajudicial killings. So, is Bangladesh really concerned about a growing drug problem, or is it exploiting the issue to intimidate political opponents? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss this from Brussels is Mahidur Rahman. He's the chief advisor to the UK chapter of the opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party, or BNP. And from Copenhagen, we have Tasneem Khalil. He's a journalist and author of the book Jalad, Death Squads and State Terror in South Asia. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Tasneem, let me begin with you. Is there a Duterte-style crackdown taking place in Bangladesh right now? Yes, Imran, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, there is a ongoing campaign of extrajudicial executions taking place right now in Bangladesh. Okay, let me ask you, Maidur Rahman. Millions of drug addicts, millions hooked on methamphetamines, particularly Yaba. Sheikh Hasina wants to do something about it. I guess you wouldn't disagree with the fact that something needs to be done. I'm assuming you only disagree with the methodology. We obviously want something to be done, but not the way Sheikh Hasina 
and her law enforcement agency is practicing because extra judicial killing is taking place. There are a lot of innocent people, you know, people are also being killed in the name of anti-drug uh, campaign. So uh, even though I am against uh, any sort of uh, extra judicial killing or cross firing, because they should be arrested and taken into custody for judicial hearing and everything. And after judge give the, given the verdict, if they are proven guilty, they should be punished. But uh, anyway, Bangladesh is going through a lot of uh, political turmoil since uh, 2005, uh, inception of uh, the present regime. Uh, sorry, 2014, 5th January, since the inception of this regime, they were unelected. It was not a participatory election. Mm -hmm. So therefore, one-sided election, this uh, par party from the government. And since then, they have taken also an agenda to eliminate their opposition party in a very concerted way, in a gradual process, so that they can create one party mm -hmm in a state of rule in Bangladesh. Okay. So, and Mr. Uh, through this process, they Certainly. are killing a lot of people. Certainly. Let, let me ask you yeah. about the responsibility that lies with, with your party as well, if we look at the root of the problem. People point to the fact that in 2004, under Khalid Azia, you introduced this RAB or Rapid Action Battalion, which is basically a death squad, according to human rights groups, that was enacted and introduced in 2004. Don't you also bear the responsibility for what's happening on the streets now, not just the Awami League? No, we don't take, because REV was introduced for the sake of uh, serious uh, terrorist activists or anything to handle them. And uh, BNP, during the time of BNP, they were used not for the purpose of the political you know, purpose, to serve the political you know, uh, you know, purpose. Uh, REV was not introduced, you know, used neither the law enforcement agency the way Sheikh Hasina's government, unelected government, is doing this, this is, uh, I mean, worldwide and Bangladeshi people, human, human rights organization, international community, every, everybody recognizes that. They are using the law enforcing agency uh, for their political purpose to serve their okay. own, Tasneem, you know, Okay, Tasneem Khalil, you, you, uh, you disagree. You're shaking your head in disagreement. Tell me why. No, I, I, I mean, it's very interesting always to see when people uh, find their conscience back. Uh, so that's a very nice thing uh, I, I see in Mr. Rahman. Uh, Rapid Action Battalion was established by Khaled Azia, uh, his leader, the lead, leader of BNP. She was involved very much, I mean, uh, she even uh, decided what kind of, what color of the dress, uh, what color of the uniform Rab is going to wear, that is black. Uh, and uh, they killed more than 900 people uh, during, uh, during uh, BNP's time. Uh, 900 people extrajudicially executed, just like Army League government, the Army League regime is do doing right now. So it is very, very unfortunate uh, that a BNP spokesperson is, is here with us now, and he's denying that that happened. Uh, let me also remind him uh, that in 2004-2003, uh, more than 50 people were tortured to death by Bangladesh Army, uh, by the Joint Forces, at the direct orders of Khaled Azia and her cabinet. Uh, and, and they said all of them died of heart attacks uh, as part of this uh, operation they titled Operation Clean Heart. So I think, I mean, right now we know enough and we, we have been talking about this for, for a very, very long time now. Now is not the time to just uh, wash our hands of responsibility. Right. We, everyone needs to own up to what they did. Okay, well, let's... Add from Singapore to the conversation, Mohibul okay. Hassan Chowdhury. He's the organizing secretary of Bangladesh's ruling party, the Awami League. Good to have you on the program. Lots of heavy accusations against Awami League. Basically, you guys are running death squads in the name of fighting drugs. It's the war on drugs, but you're extrajudicially killing people. And you know what? You're also taking out political opponents along the way. Is that true? That is simply not true. The gentleman from BNP uh, uh, have just said that this is a plot to uh, uh, t t attack their activists. Uh, if you look at the number of, if you look at the people who have recently perished, and it, of course I say that with heavy heart, uh, none of them are from the BNP. 
Uh, we have started a, a campaign against drug dealers and drug peddlers and also people who are involved in drug trading across the border with Myanmar. Uh, the ground reality is pretty different. Before I go into that, I just wanted to, um, I did just wanted to address what Mr. Khalil said. He had said that Bangladesh Army had done something. It is not simply true. Uh, uh, during the time of the BNP government, it was not Bangladesh Army. So uh, I, must, um, I must raise this flag here. It was the joint forces, which was a combination of many different law enforcement agencies who did that. So um, uh, uh, picking on a particular um, force is not the most fair thing. Uh, bef uh, 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 regarding the uh, recent campaign that we have started, the ground reality is different from uh, our two gentlemen whom we are discussing with here. They don't live in Bangladesh. Okay. We live in Bangladesh. So let me ask you, and Bhaibu, Since the Rohingya let, okay, crisis so the, had begun... Let me ask you the question. More than 120 people dead. Alleged drug dealers. We'll never know for sure because they never had their day in court. Are you absolutely convinced that every single one of those killings was justified? Is not a single death is acceptable. Not a single death is acceptable. Let's so why be, are you killing let's them? Let's be absolutely clear here. We are the party which we are the party which subjected rab individuals to prosecution. Since we came to power, there had been several incidents where out of alleged um, uh, incidents, people had died and we had investigated, prosecuted, and not only that, one of them had been given death sentence, death penalty by the uh, civilian court, not even the uh, military court. The recent drive that has started, you have to realize the ground reality here. Uh, since the Rohingya crisis had began, a lot of these um, drug dealers are heavily armed. They have brought in uh, arms from um, other places, which um, uh, we are now only we are realizing that since the Rohingya crisis had begun, situation with in relation to uh, drug smuggling in the border areas of, of Chittagong and the Cox's Bazar area had gone really out of control. Okay. Okay. And so the law enforcement agency have started this campaign. But Sir. I tell you one thing, I tell you one thing, none of this, I do not have to defend any of the killings because none of these are sanctioned by the state. These are casualties after um, a heavy encounter with but, the law enforcement agency. But of course agency. they're sanctioned by the state, Mohibo. premeditated killing. Rab, and therefore, I, 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 cannot, I don't have to be, but hold on, I don't hold have on. to be can sure can that, that, hold on, that any, any of them are... are, are hold on, are, are, you're, you're saying you don't have to de be defending the state because none of it is sanctioned uh, by the state. Have, yeah, Rab has uh, been given yeah. a mandate by Sheikh Hasina to go and be tough. That is not true. That is not what true. You, Mr. Khalil doesn't having, even live in Bangladesh. How does he know who has why, given what mandate? Why are we even having this true. conversation then? You don't I'm, even live in Bangladesh. How do you know what is the ground reality? I'm, I'm saying this to you. So, hold on. Well, may, been, can I... Well, okay, so, hold on. I mean, sitting, Imran, sitting, are you going to allow me to respond to Okay, so, okay. So, sitting thousands of miles away from okay, Bangladesh. Okay, everybody, let's take a breath. You do not know what is the ground reality Let's take a breath. Let's take a breath. You're in, well, you're in would Singapore it be right possible now. For Let's Mr. remember Chaudhry. you're in Singapore right now. Would it be possible? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Everybody. Mahidur Rahman from the BNP. Come in. Tasneem, yeah. you're going to come in in a minute. Mahidur yeah. Rahman, come in. Can I just say something? Okay. Uh, at present, uh, anti drug, uh, anti you know, narcotic campaign going on in Bangladesh, which is obviously none of us want to see that uh, the drug dealings and Yawa. Uh, is spoiling our, you know, project, uh, you know, the new generations and everything, our young generation. We don't want that. But it should be, you know, uh, taken action according to the country's uh, rule of law and everything. But at present, the country uh, doesn't have any rule of law because even in the name of the anti-drug uh, campaign and everything, and also political opponents are being targeted. And similarly, a lot of people have been killed, uh, political Not opponents. Not a single opponent from BNP Hundreds of uh, people killed. have been abducted. Uh, can, I, can I just say, my brother, uh, hundreds of people have been abducted in Bangladesh, political activists and uh, you know, the leaders in Bangladesh, and we don't have any trace for those people. What is going on in Bangladesh right at this moment? Human rights organization in Bangladesh, as well as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, European These Union, are European sweeping comments which we saying, strongly State object. Department, the, what These is are happening? sweeping comments well, which we strongly object. No, it is, it is, no, you can object, but what we are saying... There is the no world basis is saying, for this what is happening random the generalized... We don't have any freedom. The okay. world is can, can seeing what is going on. on. I want to we bring in Tasneem. The world has seen that we, we have given shelter to thousands of Rohingya people. Can I just finish? 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 Can
Okay. Would you kindly allow me to finish this? Okay. We don't Very have briefly, this, please, because you've repeated the point now. The civil society. Okay. Na yeah. Yeah. Finish it because you've repeated the point. We don't have any space for the civil society. Neither we have any space for the political political opponent to oppose those who raise their voice against the present regime. They are being targeted okay. by the secret forces, you know, I mean, law enforcement agency, and they are being either abducted or killed. That okay. is either absolutely being not true. By, I would bring it to Sneem Khalil now. By filing fabricated cases. Okay, I want to bring it to Sneem Khalil now. Mahidur, you're repeating yourself, please. Please, sir, I beg you, I implore you, you're repeating yourself now. Mohibul, give me a chance to ask Sneem a question. Mohibul, give me a chance to ask Sneem a question. Tasneem, is it that simple? We're, we're hearing from Maida Rahman that it's a, a lot of it is about taking out political opponents. We're hearing from, from Mohibul Hassan that this is I absolutely not true. Hold on, come on, please, Maida Rahman. You have to give me a chance to ask the gentleman a question. Now, Tasneem, we're hearing from Mohibul Hassan do. Chowdhury that this is not happening at all and that these are legitimate encounters. Where does the truth lie? Well, Imran, here we have a very nice preview of how uh, voices are shouted down in Bangladesh these days. Uh, Mr. Chaudhry has asked me a pointed question or, uh, about how come I know things because I don't live in the country. Uh, well, here is the thing. I mean, right before I came to the studio, a Rapid Action Battalion members were beating Bangladeshi citizens on the streets of Dhaka, and they have arrested a, a uh, opposition leader, sort of. I mean, he's a civil leader, uh, Imran Chaka, from the streets of Dhaka, simply because they wanted to speak out against extrajudicial executions. That is point number one. There is no space for speaking up against the Amelie government in Bangladesh. Number two is that it's very very, very unfortunate to see such a decent gentleman and politician like Mr. Chaudhry defending extrajudicial executions like this on your show. Uh, I, I am actually, I'm not I, I defending know him as a very killings. decent politician. Uh, uh, Mr. Chaudhry, would you please allow me to finish my piece? I, I have been listening to you, and, and now I'm trying to respond to you, uh, the, the points you, you, you brought up. Uh, next. Uh, what happened, let me remind Mr. Chaudhry that I actually was one of the persons who investigated the brutal extrajudicial execution of a leader of his party, uh, Mohimuddin Mohim, from his very city, Chittagong, uh, who was brutally, brutally tortured to death by Reproduction Battalion back in 2004. And now the same Rapid Action Battalion unit... During the time of BNP? Rab 7. Yes, sir, yes. Uh, we, we know that. The same unit has brutally murdered someone named Ekramul Haq. And there is a tape going on in Bangladesh right now that clearly, clearly shows how people are taken to a remote location they are shot dead, point blank, and then Rab is planting weapons okay. and Yaba tablets so, Tasneem, on their let me take, pocket. Let me take that point. And, Tasneem, let me take that point, right? Yes. Moibul Hassan Chowdhury. Yes. Why is it conveniently for you that Rab was capable of uh, doing terrible um, things Mr. under Mr. the previous Mr. government? Khalil, the Hold on, let me finish the, the question. Two, why the, was it, the two, can, I, can I please finish the question? Why, was it, why is it so convenient for you that Rab was totally capable sure. of doing terrible things in the past under the BNP government, but now they're sinless and spotless under your governance? Isn't that curious? Okay. Uh, the two individuals that Mr. Khalil has named, they belong to our po political party. One died during the time of the BNP regime, and one you do not have died a license to uh, kill recently anyone. at the hands of the Rapid Action Battalion. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We do not. No one has license to kill, kill anybody. And each and every allegation will be investigated by the government. And I, I, should, I should remind you here that a couple of years back, uh, an incident had happened in Narayan Ganj, and RAB individuals had been investigated and prosecuted. And one of them is actually, um, he's in jail, and he has death penalty against him. This has not happened in the past. And, what, what, and I can assure happened? you, and each and every... Happened? 
Uh, what has happened? That has happened. What, we'll the, be what has happened? Happened to the commander? What happened to the commander responsible for that killing? Let me tell you. General Ziaul Hassan is right now. He He's was promoted jail. to He's the rank jail. of major general. No, Ziaul Hassan now leads. No, NPMC. no, he was not. The, 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 the perpetrator a, is in jail. The perpetrator no, is no, in jail. Sir, the, the perpetrator is in jail. General the commanding Zia officer, Hassan, if he General bears any responsibility, he will be subjected to. The commander of Rab at that time okay. has been has been promoted to the rank of general, okay, so and he Tasneem now says, leads one of the government agencies. Okay, so Tasneem says there's the, no but accountability. But the person who was involved in the killing, okay, the Moibel person, Hassan, the person okay. who was involved, he's the saying there's no accountability involved, up the food chain, right? I want to get a final answer from Mahidur Rahman. We're hearing from Moibul Hassan Chowdhury that this government will take any excesses or abuses of power seriously and they will investigate if anybody has extrajudicially killed anybody who might not have been And we have done that dealer. very recently okay. as well. So do you believe him? No, I don't. I don't. Because they are very good at, you know, I mean, saying things which is not right very nicely and to convince the world community at, right at this moment, I must say from my heart, what is happening in Bangladesh. The Bangladesh is running towards one party rule and in, under any circumstances, they will try to establish but that. But are you going to, are the, you going to disband process, Rab? The, Rab was, as Mr. I said, Roman, was are you, are you going to disband Rab? Are you going to disband DGFI? Yes. Uh, what it will you be are. this sort of dismantle will Direct be decided, General Forces decided Intelligence by is the government. You don't have to disband it. If anybody does something wrong, I tell, let, I okay. tell you let what. The man finish. Rahman, some, finish any, your point, sir. institution, any law enforcing agency, it is the government decision. They have to decide when they are in the government. Right at this moment, they are doing all this extrajudicial killing, human rights violation, political leaders and activists. They don't have any space to you know, speak out against the government's atrocity. Country is heading towards one party rule. It is an author total authoritarian rule in Bangladesh. Okay. And absolute power makes absolute corruption. And they are totally corrupted it's, people. We are looking okay. for a simply free and fair election, okay. credible election Sweeping in Bangladesh. General and clearly, and clearly the gentleman and if in there Singapore is no disagrees. credible election, free election, okay. then democracy will not be established. Well, I'm human glad, rights, uh, you know, I'm glad we've had a free human space rights here. will not be established. And rule of law will not okay, be established. Okay, I'm, I'm glad we've had a free yeah. exchange of ideas on this program. Unfortunately, I have to move on. But I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Mohibal Hassan Chowdhury, Mahoud Rahman, and Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Be well. Still to come, the Trump administration plans to roll back regulation to make hunting easier in Alaska. But are the practices cruel and inhumane? And a migrant from Mali is granted citizenship after saving a child in Paris. Is that what it takes for refugees to be accepted in France? For many hunters, there's no better place than Alaska. The state is filled with wildlife that are a shooter's dream. But in 2015, under the Obama administration, legislation made hunting on Alaskan federal land more difficult by banning certain practices deemed cruel. Now, the Trump White House is looking to reverse those regulations, making environmental groups furious. For more, here's Christine Perovalakis. <laughs> National parks in the United States could soon be made into game reserves for hunters. President Donald Trump has proposed scrapping hunting rules on federal lands, which were passed under the Obama administration in 2015. In the U.S. state of Alaska, hunters would now be allowed to hunt black bears with dogs and artificial lights and lure them with donuts and bacon as bait. They would also be given the green light to kill female bears with their cubs, as well as wolves and pups in their dens. And hunters could use motorboats to hunt swimming caribou. During Obama's presidency, the rule was passed to avoid damaging Alaska's ecosystem. But hunters say that by targeting bears and wolves, it will increase the number of caribou available to them. The new rules would apply to more than 95,000 square kilometers of national parks in Alaska and expand hunting to 30 federal wildlife reserves across the country. 
The change is being proposed by Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, who has long favored expanding hunting rights. He has a stuffed bear along with mounted heads of bison and elk in his Washington office. Reversing a ban on inhumane hunting techniques is just the latest in a long line of environmental and conservation measures passed by Obama that Trump's administration has decided to scrap. He's dumped the Paris Climate Agreement, water pollution rules, and restrictions on emissions from coal. And last year, the U.S. reversed an elephant trophy hunting ban to the dismay of conservationists. We we're very worried that because there is such a huge demand for ivory in China and in America, that this, this uh, communication that's coming out of the Trump administration might lead people to think that it's okay to own ivory again. The Trump administration agreed to allow hunters who kill elephants in Zimbabwe and Zambia to bring home tusks or other body parts as trophies. Critics were quick to point out that Trump's family connection to the so-called sport. His sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric, have been pictured with animals they've killed on safari. Obama had banned elephant trophies in 2014 to protect the species, whose numbers have fallen due to hunting and the illegal trade of ivory. The World Wildlife Fund says the elephant population has dropped to 415,000, from between 3 and 5 million in the last century. Advocates for big game hunting say it could help enrich impoverished countries and generate income to promote conservation. But wildlife protection agencies are outraged. For them, the new proposal is cruel and unnecessary, much like pulling a trigger in the first place. Christine Pirovolakis, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Anchorage, Alaska, is Jim Adams. He's the regional director for the National Parks Conservation Association. In Bozeman, Montana, we have Bonnie Rice. She is the senior representative for the Sierra Club's Greater Yellowstone and Northern Rockies campaign. And completing our panel from Taipei is Ross Feingold. He's the former Asia chairman of Republicans Abroad. I thank you all for joining us. Jim, help me to understand this. So the Obama administration put in some safeguards so that hunting wouldn't be as awful as it is or needs to be, and the Trump administration is repealing some of those safeguards. How do you feel about that? Well, Secretary Zinke from the Department of Interior is essentially rolling back protections for bears and wolves on national preserves. There's about 20 million acres of them in Alaska. And we think it's a terrible idea. Yeah. The preserves were set aside, preserves were set aside like national parks to protect things that create wonder for us and for future generations. And bears and wolves are a big part of that. Ross Feingold, why the need to unban things like killing wolves and pups in their dens? Why the hell does the Trump administration want to get involved with that stuff? Well, we have to keep in mind that there's an issue of local control. And the state regulation in Alaska currently differs from the federal regulation. The federal regulation is more strict. And the thinking from the Trump administration is we should harmonize the federal regulation with the state regulation. And the people of Alaska have created a certain set of regulation for these hunting activities. And we should defer to them. They know best. I don't think it's the intention of the people of Alaska to eradicate the animal population. In fact, it's just the opposite. And we should defer to their knowledge, their local knowledge, rather than let bureaucrats far away in Washington, D.C. dictate what the control should be. The people of Alaska really do know best about conservation for their own lands. And that's going to be a very popular position for the Trump administration to take, not just with regard to the people of Alaska, but in other states as well. Okay, so Bonnie Rice, Ross Feingold's essentially saying that what Ryan Zinke and, and Donald Trump are doing is closer to the wants and needs of the people of Alaska, and it's the, the local state government that's got it wrong. What do you think? Well, I think that these lands are owned by all Americans, and these are national parks and preserves, 
And Americans everywhere have an interest in wildlife and the preservation of these lands. And so we believe that these kinds of extreme practices have no place on those federal lands. And there needs to be places where these kinds of very cruel and inhumane practices are not allowed and animals can have a refuge somewhere from those types of practices. And Alaska is the last frontier. That's how people, you know, everywhere around the world, certainly all Americans, think of it and as a sanctuary for, you know, protecting these wild places and iconic animals like bears and wolves. Ross Feingold, cruel and inhumane. Those are the words Bonnie Rice used. It is cruel and inhumane, right? It's, a, it's an interesting point because we have a risk here of mixing unrelated issues. Conservation of animal population. What is a proper amount of hunting activities so that the populations could be sustained, but also managed so that they don't negatively impact the human population? That's one issue. Access to federal lands. Who gets to regulate the activities on federal lands? That's another issue. The method by which hunting activities are conducted is an entirely different issue. So, sure, reasonable people can disagree about the type of methods used for hunting, but we shouldn't conflate that with whether or not the hunting activities should occur on these federal lands. And when it comes to the type of methods used for hunting, you know, some people might view this kind or the proposed activity as cruel. But clearly, there's a large number. You know, the, the other guest said these are lands that belong to all the American people. There's a lot of people in the United States who feel that the proposed hunting activity, the proposed method by which the animals are hunted, is perfectly humane and should be permitted. So we have to look at this from all sides. And okay. again, ultimately, we should defer to the, the views of the people of Alaska about what is the proper amount of hunting and the methods used. Okay, so let's go to Anchorage, Alaska again. Jim Adams, when Ross Feingold said that they are humane ways, and this is being managed, and this is a conversation, and we have to hear all sides. You had a bit of a, a little chuckle there. Tell me why. Well, the state is engaged in a 20-year war on bears and wolves across the state to increase moose and caribou populations for the ever-increasing number of urban hunters who want to take a moose or a caribou. The state manages well over 150 million acres of land in that way, or has the capacity to manage over 150 million acres of land in that way. I don't think it's unreasonable to set aside 20 million acres where hunting is still allowed, but where we leave aside some of the more cruel or inhumane ways of doing sport hunting. Bonnie Rice, do you see this as a part of a sort of broader package of rollbacks under the Trump administration? in which you can include things like pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Is that how you see it? Well, we do see this as a political move. And just another example for Ryan Zinke in terms of rolling back all kinds of protections for public lands and wildlife, um, for example, with national monuments um, in the country and rolling back those as well. Um, delisting of the grizzly bear in the greater Yellowstone region and this type of rollback of the Obama rule prohibiting these kinds of practices for hunting uh, on federal preserves in Alaska. And I would say that, you know, hunting is allowed on these preserves and Sierra Club is not, you know, we are not an anti-hunting group, um, but these kinds of practices just have no place on our federal lands and on these kinds of preserves. I think pretty much anybody that you ask would say that shooting bear cubs with their mothers and using artificial light at den sites or shooting wolves uh, and pups in their dens, that's pretty inhumane. I wouldn't call that management, and I certainly wouldn't call that sporting. Ross? Well, clearly the, the majority in Alaska have a different view. And if the majority felt otherwise, they would elect uh, representatives to their state legislature, to their governorship, who had a different view on this. So again, yeah, yeah we, if we want to say that there's a pattern of activities by the Trump administration, by the uh, Secretary of the Interior, 
on these issues. It's to defer to local views. And the majority local view in states like Alaska is to allow the local people to make these decisions, not just on whether land should be open to hunting, which we appear to have a consensus among the guests on this program, but also to the methods used for hunting. And yes, reasonable people could disagree whether these methods are humane or not. But in states like Alaska, clearly the majority has a view that this method should be permitted, and we should defer to their views. Jim Adams, we're in this period, which is the 60-day period for public comment. I guess we can consider this discussion to be uh, one of that on an international um, uh, uh, news station. Um, what's your best argument to convince people otherwise that this is a bad idea? In a nutshell, what's your argument? National parks and preserves were set aside for all Americans to protect wildlife for now and future generations. They are there because parks preserve give us a great deal of wonder. Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, places like that. The national preserves are a part of that system. We need to protect that wonder for now and for future generations. To do that, we need a naturally balanced ecosystem where wolves and bears match the predator, match the prey that are there and give us all an opportunity to save something like that for the future. I think it's a really easy argument. Bonnie Rice, are you fully on board with that argument? I am. We agree with that, with that rationale totally, yes. And so the Trump administration is most likely to go through with this. Zinke is most likely to go through with this. What happens after that? How are you going to push back? For the Sierra Club, we will continue to fight any kind of moves like this, just like we are fighting the rollback of national monuments. And we will continue to fight all of these moves to protect these places and wildlife for, for the American people and people around the world who come to places like Alaska and Greater Yellowstone, you know, specifically for these kinds of opportunities. Okay. Final word to Ross Feingold. Were you convinced by any of what you heard in the past couple minutes from Jim and Bonnie? Well, we see the weakness of the arguments, and part of it comes from mixing different issues. So as far as managing the wildlife population, the proposals that the Trump administration has made are not going to be detrimental to the overall population of animals. The issue that they are concerned about is, is whether or not the methods are humane. And they haven't made a winning argument because they're saying we need to preserve the, these forest lands or these national parks. Nobody is disputing that. But then they're trying to tag along the issue of humane methods of hunting, and they, they mix up the issues and it winds up being a losing argument. Okay. We're going to cover this again in the not-too-distant future. We'll be keeping a close eye on it. But for the moment, Ross Feingold, Bonnie Rice, and Jim Adams, I thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. It was around 8 p.m., something like that. I saw that there was a child who wanted to throw himself from the fourth floor. So I didn't have time to think. I ran across the road to go and save him. And then I saved him. That was Mamadou Ghassama meeting French President Emmanuel Macron. The undocumented migrant from Mali hit the headlines after scaling a building to save a toddler's life. Footage of his bold act went viral and Ghassama was rewarded for his bravery after being invited to the LSE Palace by Macron. The man they now call Spider-Man was given French citizenship and a job with the fire service. But some say his example reveals the extreme lengths people like him have to go to gain acceptance in French society. So, could it be made easier? Well, joining me now to discuss that question is Patricia Chagnon. She's a member of France's National Front Party. Patricia, good to have you back on the Newsmakers. Before we talk politics and the National Front's perspective on this, let me just ask you personally, when you watched that video for the first time and you saw that, that toddler almost you know, dangling and hanging from the top and this young man, Mamadou Gassama, climb up and save him, how did you feel? What were your thoughts? 
I was, I was, I was very admirative, of course, because undoubtedly uh, this young man performed a very heroic act, uh, reacted on the spur of the moment, and he uh, he saved a, a, a child's life. He absolutely saved saved a child's life. So yes, I was full of admiration for the um, uh, blunt reaction he had in just going for it and risking his own life and making you know putting himself at peril in order to save this child's life. Yes. Full of admiration, of course. So we all saw it, and then afterwards, Emmanuel Macron said, come over for a visit. I'm going to make you a citizen, and I'm going to guarantee you a job with a fire service. As the National Front, do you support that? Well, um, we just changed the name last week, actually. We're now called the Rassemblement National, the, the National uh, uh, Togetherness. But that's a detail. So, yeah, um, forgive us. We're, we're playing catch up. We're going to get used to it. But, as, you know, as the party, as the party, of do course. you endorse that? He's been given citizenship. Do you endorse it? Well, I, 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 I uh, of course, endorse that the pre president, uh, on behalf of all French people, shows the recognition of our whole country uh, to this young man. Of course, I support that. However, giving French citizenship is maybe going a bit too far. Um, we could have, I think, I would have preferred our president in saying, well, we, we recognize what you did and your heroic act and we'll give you a permit. We'll give you a permit for a stay of a year or two years and see how you adapt to France, see if you like France, see if you maybe want to go back and help help us, uh, set, help, help helping us, uh, you settle back into your country. I think giving citizenship, we feel that giving citizenship is definitely going too far. So even if he was Superman and he saved the child, you feel perhaps, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, Macron cheapened French citizenship by just handing it over to the guy? I don't think that is the right way to say it. I think, yes, one part of it is saying, well, uh, cheapening French citizenship. I think it is more, what I feel has happened here is that they have taken the subject after such rejection recently, uh, the European, pe European people waking up, the French people waking up and voting massively against immigration, against this mass immigration, to halt this mass immigration. The subject of uh, uh, Mamadou Gassama was taken on by the media and by the mainstream politicians uh, to almost dishonestly, I would say, promote mass immigration. It was a very heroic act from this man, and there is no doubt about that, and we deserve recognition. However, by it going viral and by it going worldwide and by this exaggeration uh, of recognition, you know, we have so okay. many unsung heroes. We, we, we tend to forget those, maybe. Let me allow you to set the parameters then. A couple of minutes ago, you said, why not give him a permit? So it got me thinking, okay, well, you're willing to give an undocumented migrant from Mali a permit to give him a chance to integrate into French society. So why not everybody else? Do the others also have to scale these buildings and rescue babies in order to get a permit? Listen, that is, of course, quite, quite exaggerated. Um, this was a heroic act of one person doing it, and it was, it was, it is a, these are one time, one, once in a lifetime events. You cannot, you, you must separate the big problem of, ma of mass immigration that France is, is dealing with today. Uh, we have over one, uh, 500,000 illegal immigrants at the moment in France, and we cannot just say, uh, right. well, we can solve that. Problem. We're going to solve that problem because but, of one incident. You've okay. got to separate. Certainly, you've got to separate. And I want to do that. And that's why I'm saying I'm allowing you to set the parameters here. You don't feel he should have been given French citizenship, but you feel he should have been given a permit, right? He conducted a really heroic act. It was amazing in terms of his courage, mm -hmm. in terms of his physicality, mm -hmm. his, you know, his bravery and so mm -hmm. forth, right? He put his life on the line. We still don't know much about the man and we don't know anything. That act... That act didn't say anything about whether he'll be able to integrate into French society or not. But you told me you were still willing to give the man a permit to see if he likes France. So why not some of the other tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of undocumented migrants in the country? Why not make the path easier for okay. them and give them a chance as well? I will answer you. I will, of course, answer you. We have at the moment six million unemployed people in France and nine million people living under the line of poverty. 
there is just no possibility for French society today to absorb and to, to give a future, to give a job, to ensure a future to all those people coming into France, however we might like it and however we might feel uh, the human need to do it. There is just not the physical possibility in France to do so. We have got six million unemployed people. We cannot give a future to everyone. So yes, it must remain an exception. Uh, and I think an exception in this case with Mr. Gassama is, is, is a good example of how an exception should be made in allowing him to see if he can adapt to France and to see if he can integrate. And then why not maybe in the future uh, get French citizenship, but definitely not first on. But the problem of my mass immigration to France is that the numbers are just so staggeringly high that our country cannot just cope with it. And we're not the only ones. Neither can Italy, neither can many other countries in Europe cope with the hundreds of thousands of migrants coming into our countries. Other solutions need to be found and other solutions need to be thought over how we can keep these people in their countries, in safe zones, how we can help their economies and how we can deal with judging whether they are really refugees for political reasons as uh, back in their home countries, but not by right. letting them into Europe. So nowadays, just to, to finish to finish what, what what I'm trying to the point that I'm trying to make is that 96% of all migrants that are coming into France and who have been denied refugee status by the courts, they never go back. And the French people are just fed up with that. We cannot take in any more people. So I think we need to distinguish the heroic act of Mr. Mamadou Gassama and the, the bigger problem in French society right. of those hundreds of thousands of people coming in. Patricia, I'm going to ask you a difficult question. It's a bit of a hypothetical, but I'd appreciate if you gave it your best shot. If you'd only heard about the heroic act, but there was no video, would you still be keen to maybe give the man a permit as, as you concede it? Um, I think that um, I think that it is so exceptional. That is, you know, I'm not here. I'm not a storyteller. I'm a politician. Um, but definitely, a heroic act like that should be compensated, and society should show its recognition. Undoubtedly, the fact that it was videotaped and went uh, and, and and was able to 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 go, as you say, go viral worldwide, and has has been made to go viral worldwide, serves another purpose than only his heroic act. And we must not forget mm. that. This video going viral has been used by politician and mainstream media to actually very disloyally and very dishonestly promote mass immigration. This is not uh, this is not mass immigration. Not not the two problems are quite different problems. Yeah, but Macron we himself said Macron himself said we're not just going to hand out citizenship to anybody from Mali or Burkina Faso and so forth. He he laid it out there. I can't see how you're saying Macron is using it to promote mass immigration. He gave the man citizenship and then he laid down the law just like that as well, just to remind people. So you'd agree with that, right? Uh, well, um, I, I can see it from your perspective. You're not in France. We have so many acts, heroic acts taking place, uh, not uh, be, being perpetrated by, 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 by illegal migrants. We had the other day a military, um, one of the, uh, a military person who was on R and R, who saved a child the same way. And this is a totally unsung hero. And it is not being go. It, the, the, it was not videotaped to go viral. So the different circumstances that actually came together to the situation that we now know with Mamadou Gassama. Is, is, is very exceptional. Uh, what I regret is that there are too many unsung heroes in France um, that are, that are, that are right. not promoted in such a way. Right. And I do suspect, I really do suspect, that the fact that media and look at your media are paying so much attention to it is also the fact that you're trying to make, to amalgamate between this one person situation and the problem. Well, I mean, look, we've had a 10 minute conversation about this, so clearly there's a lot to talk about very here, right? So, <laughs> Exactly. I know you don't agree with the fact that he was made a citizen, but that's a fact of life now. Mamadou Gassama is a French citizen. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. accept him as a fully fledged French citizen? Um, I believe that a French citizen is someone who needs to love France and needs to speak, be able to speak in France. So yes, I do hope that he will turn out to be a very good French citizen, of course. But what binds our nation, what binds our country, is the love for our nation, is the love for our country. 
we, we love France, and it's the fact that we speak French together. And uh, we have a very um, uh, versatile society. We have a long history of integrating people, and there is no problem at all in integrating but people. Is people that a long, certainly, is that a long way of both, saying, I don't accept him as a French citizen yet? No, I'm, I'm just taking my point clear. Um, uh, he, he has not been able to show his love. He has been able to show his humanity. He will now be able to show what he will be able to do for France and how we can be able to, uh, how we will be able to contribute to French society. And I will be very keenly watching that, of course. Patricia Chagnon, I thank you very much for joining us once thank again you. on The Newsmakers. <laughs>